Once it tells me it's recording, good. So thank you so much for everybody, you know, joining us today. Leading through change, post-pandemic travel, you know, um, we talk about this topic of travel, right, as if it's some far off distant land that we never know if we'll experience again, right? Um, and, but in order for us to get back to travel, you know, what we understand is that there are things that we need to put in place and, and responsibilities of everybody to, you know, participate in really leading through this change, right, so that we can all have an opportunity to get back to travel. I'm really excited to, you know, have the, the two panelists with me today, um, and I'll explain who they are and all of their expertise in just a moment, but let's get through some housekeeping rules first. So webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, we are going to have a 45-minute session and then a Q&A at the end. Feel free to ask questions during the webinar, though, and then we, we can address them at the end. Um, we have a lot of good information to provide to you today, but we also want to make sure we get to your questions because this is a discussion, this is a collaboration as well, and, and we want to make sure we, we have an opportunity for everybody to participate in that. Um, slides in the recording will be available. We'll send those in an email following uh, the webinar. And if you could please, um, you're going to receive a survey right after the webinar. We would love to hear your feedback. Um, we had a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago, and uh, part of the feedback was, we love this topic. Let's dive in deeper. So that's exactly what we're doing today is we're diving in uh, to some of the laws, standards, regulations that are surrounding travel, and then just best practices and what we can all do to help, um, you know, speed that along so we can all get back to traveling. So we have a couple of experts. Like my, my name is Ashley Davis. I'm, I'm with Punch Alert. I'm the VP of Community Engagement. I love to just bring folks together, uh, you know, work on collaborations and discussions and just getting information to people and providing resources. And, uh, and we have so many um, experts out there that we are trying to do, you know, a webinar series again, just to dive in deeper and to bring those experts to the forefront and get your questions answered. So that's really my passion um, is just that collaboration uh, of the minds and, and the transparency of information and the right information. Um, and of course, right next to me, I have the wonderful Stacy Porter with Porter Global Security. Um, his bio is right there. Uh, he's been uh, 20 years of federal experience managing security personnel in the aviation and security industry. He's been a liaison with the public and private sector organizations at the local, state, national, and international levels. Um, he it, it just brings a plethora of experience um, when it comes to vulnerability access, assessments, mitigation, security planning, threat and risk assess assessments, and investigative manage, uh, management operations. Um, I have just thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Stacy, and I would absolutely recommend him if you're looking to open up a business or you're looking to um, uh, understand what those risks are and what you can do uh, to reopen and get people to come um, back to your, your establishment. And then, of course, our subject matter expert today, Michelle Dawkins. Um, she's a certified trainer for over 25 years. She's spent the last 15 years specializing in occupational safety and health, both as a trainer and consultant. Um, she has a passion for worker education and training. Her experience covers several areas, including construction industries, chemical companies, environmental re remediation, manufacturing, Department of uh, Transportation, shipping and handling of hazardous materials, uh, risk management and automotive and related industries. And then, of course, you can see some of her certifications there. Um, but she is just so passionate about safety and security, and that is exactly why I wanted to bring her to the forefront today to share some of that experience um, because I don't know. I, I don't know, Michelle, who has more passion for safety and security. It might be a little competition between us, but 
what I love about it is that we're fighting the good fight together, right? Yes, exactly. Um, so I appreciate you for that. <laughs> exactly. And, and so for, uh, without further ado, I want to get straight to the meat of it. Um, I'll hand it on over to Michelle. And Michelle, just let me know when you need me to, to move the slides along. But thank you so much for both of you joining the call today. And um, I, look forward to, I look forward to hearing this information. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. And I look, um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here with both Stacy and Ashley. I think we make a great team um, because we all, all three of us do have the passion for what we do. And right now there's a common bond with everyone, you know, looking and, and asking questions about what's going on with COVID. So um, what I'm going to be doing is just preventing, presenting some of the basics, because one of the things I've realized as we've been, uh, I've been doing training over the last couple of months is that a lot of people don't know just the basics about COVID. There's so much information that we've been inundated with through news, through social media, some true, some not true. So just trying to go back to the basics and give you an understanding. Um, this uh, particular training is a part of uh, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences where I'm doing some uh, consulting work with one of the organizations out of New Orleans, the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. So, you know, just trying to put together some information so that as we begin to travel, it is that season now. Um, we've been through isolation, we've been through all of these other things, and we want to make sure that people are feeling comfortable, but they also have knowledge, you know, that they're doing their part in this thing so that we're not spreading or coming into contact um, uh, with, uh, with this particular virus. Next slide, please. Uh oh, next slide. So some of the, did it skip? It looks like it skipped. Um, so some of the basics, um, we know, you know, the different signs and symptoms, fever, cough, trouble breathing, but it's not isolated. I mean, it's not just these particular symptoms. According to some of the medical personnel, there's other symptoms. The symptoms now are growing. Um, and one of the last uh, calls that I was on, there's um, some people are being affected their, their internal organs, they're having difficulty with their kidneys, they're having other difficulties. So now the symptoms seem to be um, becoming more, more, more widespread. So we want to make sure that we understand that, you know, if you're having any kinds of difficulties, it does not necessarily mean that it is COVID, but you want to get checked out because it's not just the trouble breathing. We've heard things like uh, people losing their sense of taste and smell. There's a, a multitude of symptoms. I know when one of my family members got sick recently, he uh, complained about chest pain initially, and then he started having problems with his muscles. He said that he was at a point where he could not even move. His muscles kind of just froze on him and he was standing in front of his bed and could not even take two steps to sit down. So it's going to vary from person to person and that's what we're hearing overall. Uh, the average incubation period is roughly about five days and 99% of the people exhibit some kind of symptoms between um, 12 to 14 days. And this is why they're encouraging people to, you know, isolate themselves for that amount of time, because that's usually when the symptoms start to uh, show. But understand that only 80% of the people, I mean, only 20% of people show signs. 80% of the people are asymptomatic. So that means that once again, when we're, when we're out and about, 80% of the population are showing no signs, but they may have this infection. So what do you need to do? You need to be more vigilant and follow all of the guidelines that have been given. Next slide. So uh, these are some of the additional um, symptoms, shortness of breath, fever, chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, the loss of taste or, or smell is another telltale sign. So these are just some. And so when you think about people that you've heard or that you may know that have had some symptoms, there are some other things that um, may uh, show as well. Next slide. So we wanna make sure that you are cognizant. So what are some of the sources of infections? Droplets. Droplets are produced when that person, when a person coughs, sneezes, or speaks forcefully. This is one of the reasons why they're encouraging that we wear masks. Masks are designed to, to protect the other person, not necessarily you. 
Droplets from an infected person can travel to the mucosal areas of your body, your eyes, your nose, those already, you know, moist areas. That's how this infection is being spread. So you want to make sure that you do the physical distancing that's being encouraged. We're um, going to start to see and hear more, I'm sure, about this as the numbers are increasing in what I think today it was 18 states now have reported significant increases in the number of infections that they're seeing and the number of hospitalizations as well. So as the graphic shows, you can see that, you know, when you talk about not being distanced, how far are these droplets have the ability to travel? Next slide. And hey, Michelle, before we go to the next slide, can I add to this? Sure. Jump in anywhere, uh, Stacy. Okay, yeah, just uh, you know, looking at this slide, I, I know a lot of you, and looking at this one as well, a lot of you are concerned about how will this affect me on an aircraft. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind, especially here in the United States, and I'm sure they're doing this in other countries as well, most of the aircraft, they're working with companies to disinfect the uh, aircraft, where they're wiping down, they're doing a defog, and that defog or wipe down, it's not just sitting on top of the surface, it's actually wrapping the surface as well if you use the proper defogging systems where it's getting under the seat, the, the uh, tray tables and everything. Now also your aircraft, we know it's a tube and the air is circulated, but most of your aircraft use what's called a HEPA filter. Right. And you see a lot of those uh, same similar uh, HEPA filters being used in office spaces as well. Now, it's not 100% uh, that will catch all particles because you still have that 5% where your partner beside you, in front of you, or behind you could possibly cough or sneeze and still admit those droplets. So, again, the HEPA filter is not 100%, but it's, it's close enough, I would say probably 95% that it's catching those particles on that aircraft. And also, again, the, uh, you know, the, the planes or aircraft should be uh, wiped down, disinfected if it's not you should talk to the air carrier that you're flying on or talk to the uh, gate agent as you get to the airport and ask, you know, is it possible for me to possibly catch the next flight where they should accommodate that? So I just wanted to add that in there, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. And I want you to jump in, Stacy, because, you know, you have that expertise, especially on uh, as in, in relationship to the airline industry and, and what's going on in, in our airports right now. Um, so sources and sources of infections. The other one is uh, surfaces or objects, you know, and of course, when we're traveling, we're touching a lot of things. We're touching, you know, as we're going the, the rails, as we're going up the escalators and elevators and things like that. Just remember, you know, the closer, uh, the, the more enclosed an environment is, the more opportunity there is for, you know, something to be in that particular environment. Um, so understanding that once again, if you're touching, which you have to, you have to touch some things. Um, but you want to make sure that you're constantly washing your hands as well. And we're going to talk a little later about, you know, the purpose of soap and water, you know, good old soap and water, getting back to basics, right? And, or, you know, if you can't access that, of course, having at least a 60 to 70% alcohol-based sanitizer. So making sure that once again, if you are touching surfaces that you're taking the necessary precautions and, and cleaning off your hands, um, because remember, you know, we kind of touch our hands, I mean, touch our face, our mouth and our nose, those mucosal areas on a consistent basis without even thinking about it. So, you know, and I know one day I sat down and I just wanted to see how often I touch, touch my face and I do it, you, you just do it unconsciously. So, you know, if you're not washing in between that time and you're doing public traveling, then there's a real good possibility that you can infect yourself. So uh, as Stacy said, there are some precautions that most all of the airlines are uh, the guidelines have been set for them to do, but there's some things that we can do ourselves. And, and to add to that as well, uh, again, just looking at these two photos right here, I know in the United States, and I know we have folks on the call from uh, other countries. Internationally, yeah. One of the things I will say, you know, most aircraft or companies, uh, they're looking at handing out sanitizer as you arrive at the gate. Uh, if you don't have the equipment, they'll give that to you so you can wipe down your area on the aircraft. Also, a lot of the airline industries, they're giving out face masks as well. So I know here in the United States this week alone, the top major air carriers, Southwest, American Airlines, United, and Delta, they made it mandatory that everyone on the aircraft must wear a face mask. So you may say to yourself, well, I may not have my face mask. I forgot it. But again, they will provide that information for you so you can wear it. Now, if you do have underlying conditions, they understand that. They'll work with you. 
But if you're a passenger and you decide you want to eat your food and take two to three hours just eating food, then you may have some concerns with that. And we saw that yesterday with the American yes. Airlines flight. Our very first passenger was uh, banned from flying on American Airlines because he refused to wear a face mask. So they are serious about these procedures now. And they've tried really hard to work with the federal government. But the federal government decided not to step in and uh, let the airline industry handle that. So again, here in the United States, those are now the policies and procedures. I'm not sure how long that will go into place. But one of the things you have to keep in mind, if it's mandatory for you to wear a seatbelt on takeoff on an aircraft, they're mm -hmm. trying to treat the face mask the same way as you treat the seatbelt on an aircraft. It must be mandatory for you to wear that. I know with Delta Airlines here in the United States as well, is that they've blocked all middle seats so you can practice that social distancing. Not only that, they're also flying their aircraft at 60% capacity. American Airlines flying their aircraft at 70% capacity. So they're doing whatever they can to uh, assist with the social distancing. And also with the jet bridges, as you board the aircraft, they're no longer crowding everybody inside that jet bridge. They're doing piece by piece so they can hopefully practice that social distancing. So, you know, if you're traveling, as I saw earlier in the chat box, uh, the gentleman who said he lives in Israel and he's looking to fly into Taiwan, before you do that, I would also advise, pull up the uh, information on that country where you're trying to go and look at the numbers, how are the numbers looking? If I travel to this location, do I have to quarantine once I get back for a certain amount of days? But if the numbers are high, is it really worth me flying into that area or do I just stay where I am and possibly continue to do the uh, virtual meetings like we've been doing? I know this is the uh, vacation time for everybody. You wanna get out the house, but you also wanna practice safety measures as well. Exactly. Good point, Stacy. And remember, you know, change is not new to us. Remember after 9-11, we made a lot of changes. And guess what? We adjusted to them over time because I, I remember pre-9-11 where we were able to walk all the way up to the gate. Well, we can't do that anymore. So this is no different. This is all about our safety and making sure that we all come through this unscathed. So just practicing, you know, wearing your mask, um, and, and doing the things, the guidelines that have been set forth with the distancing, physical distancing and washing your hands, those are our new norms. And so in order to do this thing effectively so that we all don't end up sick and, uh, you know, and, and God forbid dying, we want to make sure that we adhere to the rules that are in place. This is a trying time for everyone and especially our airline personnel. So think about them as well because they are doing this. Their, their exposure is a lot more than just ours for those two or three hours that were, or four hours or whatever that were on the plane. They're going from place to place with tons of people. So we wanna also protect the workers that are, you know, are, are taking care of our needs as well. Next slide. So sources of infection, the fine particles, like you see in that, this graphic right here, they're aerosolized, so which means that they're airborne. So according to what we know right now, um, this particular virus can stay in the, in the air for about three hours. That's a, that's a long time. But with all of the precautions that are, are all of the uh, mechanisms that are in the plane, like uh, Stacy said, the HEPA filters, filtration systems, the fact that they're using a fogging system, all of that is going to help to reduce, if not eliminate. So we want to make sure that you understand those things, but you have to play your role as well. Of course, um, when we talk about being in enclosed environments or where there's high concentrations of uh, the aerosols over a period of time and you have infected persons, then that may cause a problem. But we want to make sure that if everybody's practicing these rules and these regulations that are now being put in place, then that, you know, everybody's able to travel in a comfortable manner and get to where we need to go and still enjoy our vacation time. Next slide. So these are just some examples of why we wear masks. And if you take a look at um, the, the graphic here, the lower the risk, when you have both have on masks and you're six feet apart, look at you're tremendously reducing that possibility of exposure. And then as you go up, you know, once again, um, that, that exposure level increases, the higher the risk is when no one is wearing a mask. And you know, you may not be singing or talking hard or, or loud, but those particles are still just a natural part of what occurs when we do talk and sometimes even when we just 
breathe. So the fact that you have the mask on, even look at the effect when you don't have on a mask and another person does. Okay, so look at these graphics and, and I hope that they stay in your head when you try to determine whether or not you want to wear a mask, especially when you're traveling. This is very, very important. And evidence has shown that when people are uh, both individuals or when masses of people are wearing masks, the reduction rate is much higher. And, and one thing I'll add to this, um, just a, a side note. As far as masks are concerned, one thing we have to keep in mind, although a lot of our states, the governors are saying, okay, we're gonna open because we're in phase one, two, or three, that's fine if that's what the governor of that state would like to do. But keep in mind, that's just for opening up the state. It doesn't right. mean we're in phase three of the virus. We're still in phase yeah. one of the virus, or depending on where you live. Uh, again, uh, we, we do have some folks on here from other countries. So mm -hmm. pay attention to that. Just because you're starting to reopen, which, uh, you know, that's something that we have to get the economy back up and running. You have to also be mindful that those are two separate things. We're reopening because we're in phase three, but we're still in phase one of the virus. Exactly, exactly. And, and as I said, now with the numbers going back up, there might be a possibility that we may start doing some, you know, going backwards and, and start closing some things back down. And what is that going to look like? Um, so, you know, those are all possibilities right now because, you know, we've had a lot going on, especially here in our country, that are dictating why these numbers are going up. And so now we have to take a second look and say, hey, you know, maybe we opened up a little too quickly or maybe we didn't really enforce the wearing of masks and this, you know, the, the physical distancing the way we should have. Other nations, other countries have done a tremendous job in comparison to what we, we're seeing right now. And so we may have to take a look at what they're doing that's working versus what we're doing and not, it is not working. And just, just one thing for me, this slide really speaks to me as uh, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about our shared responsibility in this, right? Yes. We may be thinking, well, it, it doesn't matter if it affects me, you know, but the whole point is, is we have a shared responsibility for everybody, right? To protect everybody and, and truly not, not eliminate the risk, just lower the risk, right? right? Exactly. Um, as much as we possibly can. So I, I really like this slide. Mm -hmm. And I apologize, there's a little bit of a delay when I hit the next button. So, yeah, <laughs> so this is just another um, example, just giving you a, a picture. And of course, when we were doing the isolation where people were at home, look it, there was no risk, you know, um, absolutely no risk. So we have to think about, you know, when they start putting these guidelines in place, they're looking, they're getting this information from our scientists, from our medical personnel, and this is why they're dictating these things. Because when you look at the probability of contagion, you know, it's tremendously reduced when you go down to the level where people were isolated. And so, it, and one of the things I did is I looked at countries where they did total isolation, or some of the cities and states that did total isolation, and their numbers are not like they are in other states. So some of us got it right and some of us didn't. But how do we now all come together so that we can really start making, having an, a greater effect on reducing the amount of contagion, uh, that you know, probability of contagion with the, with the residents that live in these uh, different areas. So the mitigation is all about you know, defense. How do we slow the spread? Having a defensive, mitigate, uh, a de a defensive plan. So of course, you know, preparedness, response, recovery. The three categories when we talk about mitigation strategies are the physical distancing, wearing your per uh, personal protective measures, uh, you know, taking, taking those into consideration, and then also cleaning and disinfecting and understanding the purpose of even cleaning and disinfecting and understand that there are two different things, that you're not just cleaning, but you're both cleaning and disinfecting. And I think Stacy gave really good examples about the fogging um, and Stacy, feel free to jump in because this is what pe makes people feel comfortable as we get ready to go back out and travel because it's not just the airline, people are traveling by bus, people are traveling by, 
you know, um, rental cars. You know, there's a whole process I go through. I have to rent a car uh, this weekend. And when I go through, you know, my daughters already know because, uh, you know, I'm already, I'm a microbiologist by training. So I go in and I already have, this was a practice I already did pre-COVID-19. I don't take that car. I'm, I'm wiping and, you know, I'm sanitizing when I, disinfecting when I step into that vehicle already. So this is something that, you know, when you get ready to travel, you know, I'm thinking already ahead, some of the things that I have to do when I go to a hotel. Um, you know, so you have to come up with your own mitigation strategies and plans when you get ready to travel. You know, I've already had a deep conversation with the hotel I'm staying in because I'm, I'm going there to do some training and I want to make sure that I'm okay. And of course, I bring in my own, you know, processes, but I wanted to know what their processes were ahead of time as well. And that's why it's so important for you to have a risk assessment conducted uh, on your business prior to reopening. Again, that's my background. I conduct the risk assessments and I'll go out and I'll assist you with what you need to do. I know everybody's following the guidelines of their state or the CDC, which is great. But again, there may be things you may be missing, just like if you're traveling to the airport. You may have people walking around the airport and, and they're not covered. They're just walking around, you know, uncovered as far as masks are concerned. And you're the one that's covered. So, you know, you have to keep that in mind. And, and that's where I can go in and assist you and say, okay, these are the measures that you need to put in place. Again, I can show these uh, show to you these vulnerabilities and hopefully they'll mitigate them. But I think right now with everyone reopening, everybody's doing whatever they can to ease the fear of the traveling public. Right. Because Stacy, what happens like with the smoke rooms? Do they still have those areas, things like that? You know what I mean? Uh, most, most of your smoke rooms, they've uh, gotten rid of those. And, and I want to say they may uh, have moved some of them outside. I know they have areas for your pets, but as far as inside the airport, most of those mm -hmm. are gone now. Okay. Good. And, and one thing I will add as far as the aircraft, as far as drinks, you have to keep that in mind. Now, the uh, flight crew, they're doing whatever they can, uh, you know, make sure they're practicing social distance as best you can on an aircraft, of course. Mm -hmm. So don't be surprised if you get on an aircraft and beverages are limited, meaning, you know, some people may want alcohol. I know some aircraft decided not to uh, serve alcohol anymore. So one thing I'll do when I travel, once I pass through security, Mm -hmm. I may grab something from a restaurant on the uh, other side of, of security and take it on the aircraft with me, depending on how long the flight is. Now, I know it's hard for someone to be on a six or seven hour flight and not have anything to drink or eat. But again, you know, those are things that the uh, flight crew, they're, they're weighing their options on how they want to do it. So again, if you have un underlying conditions, you know, they'll work with you. But you're always going to have that person, if you give them an inch, they're going to want to take a mile. So just be mindful of that, that most uh, of your aircraft, if you get on, they may limit the amount of beverages that they're going to serve as well as food. Right. So what is six feet apart? Just imagine two large dogs standing nose to tail. And that kind of gives you an idea of how, how far apart you should be when you're, you know, standing in lines or whatever it is that, you know, that you're dealing with, you want to make sure that you stay that distance. So that's just a visual I found to be really good when you start thinking, because a lot of times people don't know, and certain places don't, you know, haven't had the ability to put the markings on the floor, or it's not conducive to the markings. So you want to make sure that you understand that that six foot distance is something that, you know, you want to adhere to as well. Next slide. And so remember, airports are doing their best. So, you know, there's, but there's pieces or, or parts of this that we have to take ownership of. So your personal protective measures, making sure that, you know, you're not touching your nose, your mouth and your eyes, because as I said, those are your mucosal areas. Those are those moist areas that we know that the virus is looking for to get into. Um, viruses need a host, okay, in order to, to, to live, to survive. You want to make sure that you're utilizing cough etiquette. That's really key because once again, this is how this gets out. Washing your hands with soap and water frequently and knowing how to wash your hands effectively as well. And then wearing your face uh, coverings when you're in public areas. So it is advisable when you're walking through the airport and things like that. This is a video, you know, unlike a germ, a virus needs a host to live, as I just said, because uh, viruses have a weak membrane, but it can be broken down with soap and water. So we want to take a look at this video just to give you a really good 
a graphic of what that means, because I don't think a lot of people get this. Of course, it's commercial, right? You know that the best way to prevent the spread of coronavirus is to wash your hands. Wash your hands! Wash your hands! But why? It's because soap, regular soap, fancy honeysuckle soap, artisan peppermint soap, just any soap absolutely annihilates viruses like the coronavirus. Here's how. This is what a virus like coronavirus looks like. It's a bit of material surrounded by a coating of proteins and fat. Viruses easily stick to places like your hands, but when you rinse your hands with just water, it rushes right over the virus. That's because that layer of fat makes the virus behave kind of like a drop of oil. You can see it happening in this demonstration. Oils are just liquid fat. What happens when you pour oil into water? It floats. It doesn't mix. But add soap, and suddenly that fatty oil dissolves into the water. I think it the, the it, and one thing I will say that uh, as Ashley mentioned, this is being recorded. So if you want to go back and watch the video, uh, definitely yeah. uh, feel free to do so. So I'll, we apologize for the uh, buffering of the video. we'll go ahead and move on. Yeah, we'll move on. But that's a really good video, so hopefully you will take advantage of the recording. So decontamination of surfaces and objects, disinfecting and cleaning, and not just thinking of, you know, your, your, your mode of transportation, how you're getting there, but also where you're staying. The hotels that you're staying in, your Airbnbs, there should be some disinfecting and cleaning. So you wanna kind of ask those questions ahead of time. I was very specific when I called the hotel. I wanted to know how knowledgeable they were with their cleaning routines, and I was able to get a lot of information. Um, and then shared with her that I'm actually coming down there and I will be doing some COVID-19 training. So, you know, there's certain things that I'll be looking for and I'll be sharing with them. Um, and, I, and I don't mind doing that, you know, so just knowing that when you go on vacations now, you really have to stop and really come up with your plan and what it is that you need to know before you go and start staying in these facilities. Next slide. And, and this is part of the uh, risk assessment piece that you see right here. You see the uh, first and second slide, I mean, first and second picture. Uh, the young lady she has on a face covering or face mask and, and you'll see that a lot as you uh, check into hotels now you see how they're doing the uh, disinfectant of the seats uh, she's mm -hmm. wiping down uh, the phones it look like she's wiping down the um, wall as well but one mm -hmm. thing you have to keep in mind you know you have to also be mindful to do it yourself uh, wipe down your uh, remote control of the hotel right. if possible you know try not to touch it if you uh, can't the uh, phone in the rooms you want to ensure you wipe those down as well. I, I've never used the uh, hotel phones in my room because most of us have cell phones now, or I'll just uh, go downstairs to the uh, front lobby if I have a question, but I, I rarely use a uh, phone in my hotel room anymore. But one of the things that's part of the uh, risk assessment, again, is how often are they cleaning the rooms like they should? I mean, I know they change the sheets, but as far as the disinfectant piece of it now, that's very important. And you know, how often are your uh, crew uh, wearing the facial shields, how often are they, you know, wearing gloves, things like that. So they want to make sure they're protected because you're going to have various people uh, from different walks of life staying at these hotels. So they want to be protected as well since they may have families at the house that they have to go home to. And another thing, they are uh, doing very little uh, housekeeping now. Um, for example, if you stay an extended amount of time, they're not coming in every day and changing your sheets and uh, or, you know, fix it, making up your bed and things like that. And they're letting you know ahead of time. That was one of the conversations. I don't, I didn't want them doing that. I rather, once I get in, then I have more control of that room because I'm taking care of the necessary cleaning during that, you know, during my, my extended stay while I'm there. So I want to make sure, and I do that, like I said, these are some of the exercises I do already. Uh, Stacy, you're probably like me. When I go into hotels, I already have a regiment. A couple of my mentors are firefighters, so I walk the evacuation route. I mean, there's several things that I do before I even 
you know, bed down, you know, or get comfortable in a hotel just based on what I do for a living. And I'm sure the same thing is uh, true for you, Stacey, because when we, when you do risk assessments, there's certain things that kind of stand out for you just because. Um, so I'm kind of really particular when it comes time for traveling and certain things that I do for hotels or Airbnbs or, you know, in my, whatever the mode of transportation that I'm using, I'm already looking for certain things. Yes. And Ashley, do you have anything to add to this as well with your background in the travel industry? Right. Yeah. Just some of the things that I was thinking about, you know, uh, points that you guys made about the workers that have to be out there, right? My father is a, um, he, he transports nitrogen and oxygen. And so he is considered an essential worker. Yes. And there are times where he has to travel down the road and stay at a hotel. And I, I know, you know, he drives, you know, for 10 hours or whatever it is, and then he gets to the hotel and then he is frantically cleaning the heck out of the hotel room, right? right? Because, you know, he, you know, he knows it's important to do so. He, he may be extremely exhausted, but he knows that he needs to wipe these things down and, right. and he has this whole regimen that he goes through. Um, to make sure that he's keeping himself safe, but also those uh, other people. Not that he thinks he's been in contact with, with uh, you know, a lot of people that have been affected, but just the thought of n knowing that if you're carrying it without knowing it, or if you've been exposed without knowing it, and then you're spreading it to someone else because you are too tired to wipe something down, you know, before, you know, you settle in or whatever. Um, you know, he just, he does take all those proper precautions. Um, and so I, I just know firsthand that it's definitely something that we are going to have to, uh, get into the habit of, um, mm -hmm. when we do, you know, get back to traveling. I think that it's important anyways, just to be clean and sanitary and, and not pass along germs if we don't have to. Um, so, so I, yeah, that's just what I wanted to say about that, but. And Ashley, I think those are very good points because we have to take into consideration when we leave after whatever amount of time we stay there, that personnel still has to handle the laundry and the trash and all of those things. And if we don't know, you know, if you don't know if you're positive, just think about that next person. And is their, you know, is their health compromised in any way? And then who are they going home to? So, you know, we have to see, see this chain and understand that we all have to take part in this because we don't want somebody to become infected because of what we didn't do. And then now they're passing it on, you know, when they're going home and taking care of maybe their elderly parents, for an example, you know, so understand your role in this. This is all of us coming together and saying, you know what, we're going to make sure that I'm going to make sure I do the right thing so that it's not being uh, passed on to the next person. So that's yep, really good. Exactly. So this is um, for those of us who may decide to drive, understand that all of the rest areas are no longer open. So you got to have a plan. You know, traveling now is going to be just a little different or a little challenging because you got to have a plan. What are you going to do if the next rest area isn't for 46 hours? You know, um, what does that look like, especially if you have small children? So you really want to start, you know, you got you to gotta make phone calls. You got to, you know, I know I have AAA, you know, and they, they're wonderful when it comes to stuff like that. You know, not do they only tell you, you know, where the, the, uh, tri the uh, what work on the highway, DOT is working, but now they're going to have to tell people, okay, you won't have a rest area, so, but you may want to do this, or you may, you know, have to utilize like a McDonald's or, you know, a, a facility like that, but if they're closing early, you know, you really have to think through your travel plans is what I'm trying to say. Um, and for those truckers, you know, there was a, that was very challenging because as Ashley said, they are essential workers, but they were having these kind of challenges out on the road. They were going, you know, these guys drive for hours and then they're trying to go and utilize the restroom and they can't. So, you know, and they're, they're on time guidelines. So that becomes very, very difficult. So we want to think through this whole process of how is this changing in our new normal and what role um, do I play in this, you know? Next slide. One thing that I was just going to say about um, rest areas is the state of Arizona um, recently allowed uh, for the, uh, or permits, I guess, for the food trucks to go and set up at the rest wow. areas to provide um, 
to provide a source of food for the truck wow. drivers because with everything closed down, right. you know, they weren't able to properly be fed. <laughs> so um, I thought that was pretty interesting that, you know, uh, and I don't know of any other states that did that, but I, I know California didn't because my dad drives his truck all around California and Oregon and Washington. Um, and he was like, wait, I, I want a food truck at my next truck stop. So, so oh, things might change good. in the future. Who knows? Yeah. You know, I mean, I kind of like that, that idea, you know, that that's creative thinking because they can't just whip into a drive through like we can with a big 18 wheeler, you know, so exactly you think like that, you know, how are they being serviced? So I thought, I think that's exactly. very good, you know, very good. And, and, well, and especially the business, the small business. Yeah. Group. And especially him, right. Because he's delivering, um, flammable, yes. Yes. Um, you know, materials. And so he especially has to be very careful about where he puts exactly. his truck or stops off. And yeah. I mean, he has to completely set up that up logistically right. ahead of time. So yeah, their, their guidelines are a little different when you carry in hazmat. Exactly. Yeah. So, and they can't <laughs> stop just arbitrarily stop even where some of the other trucks are able to stop because of the type of uh, products that they're carrying. So really good exactly. um, information. So remember, there's no vaccines at this point. And, and it's going to be a while before we get a vaccine because there's three phases to a, any kind of vaccine trial. And you have to look at, um, you know, you have to take time and safety is one of the big things that they have to assure, you know, as they're developing um, vaccines and then efficacy. How efficient is this? So this, all of this is a process. It's not a something that we can just, you know, tomorrow come up with a vaccine. And then you have to do a trial of a large population. So it usually takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months. And there's still no guarantee after that amount of time, whether or not that vaccine is going to be effective. So, you know, right now we have to do what we can do as far as vaccine, you know, with there being no vaccinations, no medication. Right now, it's all about us being vi vigilant in what we know, which is, you know, making sure that our diet, our our immune system, all of those things are uh, kept up to par um, and that we're exercising and, you know, doing the, those things that the guidelines that they've put out there that we're working with them and not against them because that's what's hindering our process right now when we start uh, becoming lackadaisical and that's why we're seeing our numbers grow the way we are right now here one, in this one, country. One thing I will add when it comes to the uh, airport as far as the uh, face masks we talked about earlier. I don't believe uh, the airports, and I can't speak for other countries, but I don't believe the airports are doing temperature checks. So that's why it's so important, as Michelle mentioned, that we have to do our own homework. So if you know for a fact that you're sick, hopefully we won't have passengers traveling to the airport to take a flight, because again, I'm not sure if the uh, airlines are doing temperature checks, and I haven't seen that anywhere, so I don't think they are. Mm -hmm. But that's something that we have to keep in mind. You know, why risk traveling when you're sick and you're just going to affect the other person on that aircraft. Right. And, and understand still 80% of the people are asymptomatic. So they may not even have a fever or anything and they're, right. and they're, you know, they can be infected. So we want to keep all of those things in our mind and, and ask ourselves, okay, what's the best way for me to travel, to do it safely, to, you know, make sure that I'm safe, but also make sure that the other passengers are safe. And that's by following the guidelines that we've talked about already. Next slide. And doc, this is Dr. Corvett and her team. They're doing an excellent job in um, providing as, uh, you know, as much information. Remember, coronavirus is a novice, a novel virus, meaning that it's, it's a new virus. So it's not acting the way the other viruses did in the past. So the, that's why we're constantly seeing updates and changes because this is new. There's there's, this wasn't, it didn't exist before. So they're looking at what some of the other viruses did. And this one is taking on a whole different route. Um, and some of the symptoms and all of those things that we're hearing about are different in comparison to some of the others. So the question is, where are you getting information? We want to make sure that you use resources that are viable, that's providing you with scientific or medical information, and not just relying on social media or the media. You, you want to go to these reliable sources. And so what we've done is we put together um, some information or resource links for you. And we started with uh, both uh, Stacy's uh, Portal Global Security is there, Porter Global Security, as well as uh, my uh, 
website is there, uh, Occup Occupational Safety and Health, and then the risk assessment, and then some of the other uh, global communities, and I'll let Stacy and um, Ashley talk about some of these uh, with you. Yeah, so I, I definitely wanted to provide links to these resources. You know, if you are looking at conduct, conducting risk and th threat assessments, obviously uh, go to the Porter Global Security to get more information and, and get in contact. I will have Stacy's information up after this. Um, if you are looking at education and training, Michelle is an excellent resource for that, um, and her website is right there as well. Um, if you are looking for a community of support that of other like-minded individuals who are talking crisis ready and um, just uh, mitigation and risk and just what's happening on a daily basis and what's what's the new change today and and what are some people doing to take action and make change going forward uh, the crisis ready community is an excellent resource for that it's a support network um, and then some of the other uh, resources that we have I, I love the global timeline of reopening for travel, uh, just because you can see, you know, what's opening and where, and you can filter it by region and by um, industry. Uh, so I, I love that resource. Um, and then of course, the industry guidance uh, from ustravel.org, you can see what the tourism industry is putting in place to hopefully build your confidence and also provide you with um, some helpful information as to what they're doing specifically uh, to help the, the tourism industry, you know, get back up and running again. And then, of course, OSHA has specific some airline industry uh, information there at that one. And then, you know, the, the John Hopkins and the other COVID-19 projections are just interesting to um, kind of look at. I, I'm a visual person, so I love to see graphs and charts and, and things like that and how the numbers are um, working itself out. So those are just some, uh, some good solid resources to go to as well. Um, this will pre be provided um, in, in the uh, follow-up email. Uh, so you can either, you know, grab it from here or I'll be sending this slide deck to you. And then our, our contact information, we'd love to hear questions. Does anybody have any questions um, that came up throughout the webinar or anything specific? I know um, one of you said uh, about traveling soon to Taiwan as soon as the flights resume. I would definitely recommend you um, keep an eye on that reopening of travel uh, timeline so that you can see you know, when that's going to be made available. They may already have something up there. I'll have to check that out. But anyone else have any other questions or, or just any side notes or anything that, um, that folks wanted to share? I see uh, Ms. Ellaby has a question. Should we wear gloves when we're traveling? Um, the issue with gloves is that it leads to a lot of cross-contamination. Um, and so my, my stance on that is um, unless you're not going to be touching a lot of things, because understand that if you have on gloves, say I'm traveling to the airport and I have my luggage, I have my keys, my purse or whatever, you know, I shouldn't have keys, but my purse and my cell phone and um, I touch something and then I go back and touch one of those items. I've already cross contaminated. So the easiest way when you're traveling is to constantly wash your hands versus wearing the gloves. Because if you're going up the escalator, you're gonna to be touching that most likely, balancing yourself. And then once again, whatever you have on your person, are you gonna remember not to touch that cell phone or touch your boarding pass or touch, you know, th th that, increases the probability of cross-contamination versus just having you know no gloves and being able to constantly use that the uh, use you know wash your hands or use your sanitizer the only thing just remember because you're using a 60 to 70 percent sanitizer and you're using it more frequently then your hands are going to be drying out and you want to keep that moisture on your on, in your hands on, on your body because that's a natural defense mechanism. So when you start drying out your hands, they're more susceptible to something getting inside through the skin. So you know you have to be able to balance all of that. So in answer to your questions, my advice would be to limit the uh, wearing of gloves when you're traveling and just increase the usage of washing your hands um, or using the sanitizer. 
And when you're washing your hands, you're doing the full 20 minutes. Um, the, um, 20 seconds, I'm sorry. You're doing the full 20 seconds. Science has shown that five seconds won't do it. 10 seconds won't do it, but 20 seconds is able to kill the coronavirus if you're, when you're washing your hands. And one thing I'll add to that, if you don't mind, Michelle, is uh, as far as the wearing of gloves, you know, it's fine if you're going to get on the aircraft and you're going to wipe down your area. Again, they are wiping them down, but if you're not comfortable with that and, and you're giving some sanitizer, you know, it's fine if you want to wipe that down wearing your gloves, but again, wow. you have to properly dispose of those gloves when you're done. And just be mindful, as Michelle said, touching things. Now, one thing I will also add, I know a lot of the uh, airports, they're going to a touchless mechanism where you may not uh, have to print out your boarding pass. You can use your phone. I know TSA, they're doing uh, as much as they can not to touch a lot of your items. So most times now, uh, when they have the uh, liquid uh, policy in place, you can do that now with your food where you're going to be able to put it in uh, clear plastic bags and they're not going to be touching that. So just pay close attention to that. One thing you also have to keep in mind, uh, things may be okay traveling now because they'll have the signage. They may have the uh, voice uh, notifications going on in and around the airport and it may not be as crowded. And that's right now because things are slowly reopening. But just keep in mind as time goes on, that airport will start to fill up as we've seen before. And, and that's where you're going to have to uh, be mindful of the social distancing. Should I wear my mask or, or should I wear the gloves? But, you know, as Michelle said, you know, if you're putting on gloves from the time you get out your vehicle at the parking garage, as you walk into that airport, just keep in mind how many times you've touched so many different things while you have those gloves on and then getting on that aircraft, touching your seat, touching the, um, you know, the uh, luggage area where you uh, store. So just be mindful of that. And so when we do go to the touch list and you have those phones, you just got to make sure you got those extra battery packs. So, you know, like I said, it, it's a lot of planning in this because, you know, otherwise you're going to be waiting in that common area to use those, uh, the, the, the plug-in areas. And that's where a lot of traffic is a lot of times already. So just think through your, tra your travel, just, you know, to try to walk yourself through what is it, it, what is it that I need? What is it that I'm going to use to keep myself, you know, keep the areas disinfected and keep myself sanitized and all of that kind of stuff. Just actually have a plan. So you, you make a good point, Michelle, and I, I, uh, I, ha I have a experience in the travel industry and, and I work with a lot of travel advisors. And I think that it, it's, it, it's overwhelming, right, to make all these plans. So yeah. it would be important to connect yourself with a travel advisor who is going to be well-versed in all of this information and how you can protect yourself and where should you travel and where shouldn't you travel and right. what places should you stay at and what places shouldn't you stay at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, AAA is a really good resource. They have great travel agents. Um, but if you have, I, I would just highly suggest you find a good travel agent um, going forward because we're, we're in a new travel environment and it is their job to be that resource for you. Exactly. And it's not an, a, at any additional cost. You know, exactly. the, the tourism industry pays those travel agents through commission. So they're there for you, utilize their services, um, you know, and, and just uh, that's exactly why they're there is to be that resource for you. Um, I do see one other question here. Do wearing sunglasses and visual glasses help to protect your eyes? Well, right now they're saying that any kind of uh, glasses are protective. So yes, that, that's a very good question. And yes, that does assist in protecting your eyes. As long as you're not touching them too much, right? You put them on, exactly. don't touch them, keep yeah. your hands away. <laughs> yeah. So that's our no new norm. On and off. As you said, that's our new norm. We got to <laughs> just kind of keep your hands away from, you know how we used to tell our kids, keep your hands away from your face. Um, so yeah, we yeah. got to do that now. We got to, you know, really watch what we're doing with our hands. And, you know, once we have our, our, our eyewear on and our mask on, we don't want to keep touching them because then once again, there's a possibility you can get something in your eyes or uh, your nose or your mouth and, you know, and here we go all over again. So. And you also have to keep so, them on, you. although you have on glasses, you know, you still have those droplets and those droplets can easily get in yeah, between. Yeah, get past. So. Yeah. Because the next question would be, well, do you recommend goggles? 
Um, hopefully we don't have to, you know, that's why you're seeing a lot of people that wear the face shields. Um, and now those are readily available as well. You know, they're just the plastic shields that you wear. I saw one the other day that's made like a visor, it just kind of goes right around your head. Um, and that may be something that, you know, that's comfortable. Um, you still have your mask on underneath, but now it's protecting that whole facial area. Um, and, and so, you know, hey, if that's, that makes you feel more comfortable because they're, they're, that's close enough to your face because it fits just like a visor would. So it's close enough to your face where it's covering, you know, right above your eyebrows. And so I think that that's a, a, a better solution even. Yeah, um, I'm just going to launch a quick poll. I'm interested in, you know, where everybody's at um, in travel. So if you could just take a moment, I'm going to launch this poll and answer these couple of questions. We would love to hear your feedback. And uh, Stacy and, and um, Michelle, you guys can go ahead and poll as well. Okay. Okay, we'll give it just another second for people to come on here. Okay, let me go ahead and just end that. Let's see if it will share the results. Can you guys see the results there? Yes. So what is your comfort level traveling within your community and or state? Looks like 25% are very comfortable, 75% are comfortable. Yeah. And then what is your comfort level traveling outside of your state? See, I, I thought that that might be the case where it was like, oh, leaning more towards me, not so comfortable. Yeah. And then, and then it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. As the vacation season begins, how concerned are you with others traveling into your state, right? And I was thinking that was probably going to be the case. So I've been talking with uh -huh. a lot of the leaders in the tourism industry, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're trying to figure out how they're marketing their tourism, right? Are they marketing it to uh, external like they typically would to say hey come and come into our state we're open um, but I noticed with the state of Arizona that they're actually doing a lot more um, internal state marketing right like vacation where you know come and just get out of your house and come and enjoy us we're doing all these things to keep it clean and safe and everything else so it, it's definitely interesting I, I, yeah. I thank you so much for participating in that poll very interesting. So I just want to, again, thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Um, I hope this was very helpful. Uh, we are going to send out the recording. You see our contact information there. Do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us. We would be so happy to help you point you in the right direction or provide you with what you need. Um, again, thank you, Stacy and Michelle, for your time today. Uh, you know how much I truly appreciate each one of you, and um, I just you. I just look forward to um, you know working alongside of you to get people into this new travel envi environment that we're going to be in. So thank you. Awesome. You're welcome. And, and one thing I'll add: w this is our second webinar series, so we would like to keep this going. So those surveys are definitely important because we want to hear your voices, and we'll know what topics we can uh, attack more. I know one of the things we need to uh, speak a little bit more on is the uh, international travel. I know we yeah. can't you know, travel outside of the United States right now, but as we mentioned earlier, we do have people on this call and I'm sure they have uh, questions and information as to how things will look for them traveling within their country. So that's something that uh, we could probably look at down the road as well. Yeah, and I know we've gotten um, uh, feedback about wanting to learn about where the event management space is going, you know, what are events going to look like in the future. So there's more to come on that. We've got some good experts coming up. Um, and so just stay tuned for some uh, uh, of our upcoming webinar series.
Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Yes, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.